This will be our last set of notes in Unit 8, which is Motivation, Emotion, and Stress. And this notes being the set of notes on stress, both experiencing and coping with it. And that's what the standard is, and that you have to understand the phases of stress as defined by Cellier, but then how, what recommendations there are according to research on how to cope with stress. So what is stress? Psychological states cause physical illness, and that's something to just consider really quickly. Your psychological state can cause physical illness, and we'll talk about why. Stress is any circumstance that may be real or perceived and threatens one's well-being. So when severe stress is felt, it impairs our ability to cope with it. That's why stress is such an ugly cycle. And again, we're going to talk about how, how, why is it that stress can cause, can be so physically debilitating. So a stressor is a stressful stimulus. This is the thing. It's a condition demanding adaptation. Okay, so it is the car accident. It is the final exam. It is the thing that causes the stress. The stress is the physical and mental changes that occur in response to a stressor. It's your reaction to the challenging or threatening situation. So four components to stress, um, to the stress response. There's the cognitive appraisal. So you identify the threat and determine how to cope. And this is different for everyone in that some people cope very calmly, others not so much. Physiological response is the body's reaction. This is very similar to our experiencing of emotion, right? Um, so there's the cognitive appraisal on how we determine how we'll cope, the physical response. Subjective feelings would be the emotions that are tied. Do we cry? Do we regress or do we repress? Do we kind of avoid other people? And then behavior, taking the action taken because of the stress and what does that look like? Stress is not merely a stimulus or response. It's a process by which we appraise and cope with environmental threats and challenges. When short-lived or taken as a challenge, stressors can have positive effects. And we've talked about that with your Stopson's Law. However, prolonged or threatening stress can be harmful. And we're gonna talk about um, some types of stressors. There's the catastrophic event. Um, this is the sudden, unexpected, potentially life-threatening experience or trauma. So um, maybe being sent off to war as a soldier in a car accident or some kind of um, natural disaster. Life changes and strains are circumstances that create demands to which people have to adjust. So having a child, getting married, moving, okay, and moving across the state or across the country or just across the street, whatever it is. Chronic stress are those that continue over time, um, over a long period of time. So let's say crime levels in your neighborhood. Um, chronic illness, um, traveling or unemployment, um, not just traveling, but like even construction that's going on around you. And then daily hassles. These are the irritations, pressures, annoyances that might be significant alone, or I'm sorry, might not be significant alone, but they add up. So your daily commute to work, is it long? Is there traffic? Um, is there a, do you have a high workload at work, long lines to wait in, any of those daily hassles. So let's talk about the response system. Cannon has in Cannon Bard proposed that stress response, being fast, was a fight or flight response marked by an outpour of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is adrenaline, from our inner adrenal glands, increasing heart and respiration rates, mobilizing sugar, and ultimately preparing us for fight or flight, right? The hypothalamus and the pituitary gland also respond to stress and this being more slow. So they trigger the outer adrenal glands to secrete cortisol, right? Which is how we cope with stress. This is just the beginning. If the stress is longer lasting, there's other kind of systems. So a quick stressor, let's say like an act car accident that's lasts like you having to deal with that and the stress surrounding it is just a few hours if it's a small one, right? Or maybe it's a week, it's, it's not very long. However, if it's a longer lasting stress, like work, 
um, having a new baby or preparing for a wedding, any of those kind of life things, we go to Hans Selye's General Adaptation Syndrome. According to Selye's stress response to any kind of stress uh, or any kind of stimulation is similar. That doesn't mean that we don't individually respond to stress differently. What he's saying is that we go through the same three phases, and that's what we'll talk about here. Stage one, or phase one, is alarm reaction. And if I were you, I'd draw a little alarm clock to help you remember. The hypothalamus sets the fight or flight response into action, releasing neurotransmitters and hormones to deal with the stressful situation. If the stressor persists over a period of time, this initially adaptive reaction can become distress as it depletes the body's energy and defense resources. It can cause high blood pressure, deterioration of immune system, fatty deposits in blood vessels, ulcers, etc. So no wonder stress is so damaging. Stage two is then resistance. So if the stressor persists, but not so strong that it overwhelms the organism during stage one, the individual begins to rebound in this second stage of resistance. Outwardly, the body appears like, okay, I've got this. I'm gaining an advantage. I'm resisting the stressor. Inwardly, you're trying to restore homeostasis, yet the body is still working to cope with the stress. Resistance only applies to the original stressor. If another stressor is introduced, Defenses could be so depleted that they may be unable to respond to the second stressor. Very interesting. The third stage is exhaustion. If resistance fails, so if the stressor doesn't go away or if we just cannot keep up with it and resistance fails to relieve the stress, the symptoms of alarm reappear in stage three with exhaustion. This time it's accompanied by even more powerful autonomic nervous system responses. It overcompensates. And the body has already used so much energy that if the stressor is not removed, exhaustion and eventually death will occur. Usually there are warning signs of exhaustion, like heart attack, um, clogged arter arteries, excessive colds and flus, frequent headaches. All of these things being signs that, whoa, you've got to do something about your stress levels. Think of it as this, your sympathetic nervous system is never taking a rest and your parasympathetic nervous system is never kicking in to help calm you down. So you're never returning back to homeostasis if you are always stressed. Of course your body is going to be sick. Any stressor, including mental processes like worry, can affect one's health and resources like the immune system. Um, so the immune, human immune response, which has evolved to deal with short-term stressors, may react to chronic stressors by breaking down and actually turning on itself. How in the world does this happen? Here's the thing, there's no physical enemy for the immune system to battle. So the bodily responses become maladaptive and the body becomes more vulnerable to infection and injury. It's like it's fighting itself so then when something external does come in, like the flu or some kind of infection, it can't fight it off. So it's a depleting our immune system. Stress can have a variety of health-related consequences in that it can be like hypertension and chronic heart disease, there's headaches, of course there's the immune suppression, but all of these being kind of different. But then the things that we have in our daily lifestyle, whether it's unhealthy behaviors like smoking, drinking, poor nutrition, poor sleep, can then just perpetuate the problem. This part is not in your notes, so you'll just wanna kinda of jot it down in the, in the margin, but personality types have a lot to do with how we deal with stress. There's type A and there's type B. Type A is used for competitive, hard driving, impatient, verbally aggressive, and anger prone people that become stressed out quickly in most cases. And I'd like you to think of like a prototype for this type of person. And this, I want you to, I'm not gonna give you an example because I don't necessarily know, but what would you think? Um, type B would be more easy going, relax people that seem to deal with stress easily and don't get too anxious or worked up. Again, come up with the best example, a prototype, and I want you to make sure you write that down in your notes. So the last thing we'll talk about is how we cope with stress. And reducing stress by changing events 
that cause stress or by changing how we react to stress is called problem focused. So if your car keeps breaking down, causing you stress, you address the problem, you buy a new car, right? You have removed that stress, you've removed the problem. When we can't change a stressful situation, and respond by attending to our emotional needs, it's emotion-focused coping. So you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend. There's no way to problem solve that one. So it causes you stress. You have to then seek support from family and friends. That's emotion-focused coping. So there's four different types of um, recommendations you could say. Cognitive being change your thoughts, like thinking of a stressor as a challenge rather than a threat. Emotional being no, you have support. You have a system in place of, or even getting advice. Like you have people f who are there for you. Behavioral being changing your behavior to minimize the impact of stress. So this would be time management, getting rid of some activities, saying no to too many things. And then changing your physical responses could include medication, relaxation, or even exercise. 